Chapter 2, Atoms, Molecules, and Ions Philosophers from the earliest times have speculated about the nature of fundamental stuff, or matter, from which the world is made. Early Greek philosophers thought that the material world must be made up of tiny, indivisible particles called atoms. And this notion reemerged in Europe during the 17th century. As chemists learned to measure the amounts of elements that reacted with one another to form new substances, the ground was laid for an atomic theory that linked the idea of elements with the idea of atoms. This theory came into being during the early 1800s with an English school teacher named John Dalton. The theory that atoms are fundamental building blocks of matter re-emerged in the early 19th century, championed by John Dalton. He said that each element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. All atoms of a given element are identical to one another in mass and other properties, but the atoms of one element are different from the atoms of all other elements. Atoms of an element are not changed into atoms of a different element by chemical reactions. And atoms are neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. They're simply rearranged. And compounds are formed when atoms of more than one element combine. And a given compound always has the same relative number and kind of atoms. These postulates, these postulates that Dalton uh, proposed in the early 1800s, explain several, also explain several simple laws of chemical combination that were known at his time. One is known as the law of constant composition, which says in a given compound, the numbers and kinds of atoms are constant. This is the basis of the fourth postulate of Dalton. Another fundamental chemical law was called the Law of Conservation of Mass, also known as the Law of Conservation of Matter, that we'll see a slide for in just a minute. This says that the total mass of the materials present before a chemical reaction and the total mass present after a chemical reaction are equal to each other. Well, this was the first time that someone, when John Dalton, had proposed these ideas of atoms, and his theory not only explained the known facts, but also predicted some new ones. Dalton used his theory to deduce a law called the Law of Multiple Proportions. The Law of Multiple Proportions said that if two elements, for example A and B, combine to form more than one compound, the masses of B that combine with a given mass of A are in the ratio of small whole numbers. And we can see that this is supposed to show how N and O can combine, and they should be in small whole numbers, N1, O1, N1, O2, etc. These led together to the law that we just talked about, called the Law of Conservation of Mass, that the total mass of substances present at the end must be the same as the mass of the substances that were at the beginning of the process. Well, Dalton reached his conclusions about atoms on the basis of chemical observations in the macroscopic world of his laboratory. As scientists began to develop methods for more detailed probing of the nature of matter, the atom, which was supposed to be indivisible, began to show signs of a more complex structure. We now know that the atom is composed of still smaller particles called subatomic particles. One of these is called the electron. One of the first devices that was used to determine or discover the electron was called a cathode ray tube. This is a picture of a simplistic picture of a cathode ray tube. And in a cathode ray tube, electrons move from the negative electrode called the cathode to the positive electrode called the anode. We can see here's the negative 
and here's the positive right here. This picture of a cathode ray tube can show the path of the cathode rays going through, and the cathode rays can be deflected by the presence of a magnet. And this negative and positive plate right here are supposed to indicate the positive and negative parts of the magnet. And you can see that the electron path can take one of three directions. This one, straight ahead, or to the side. It was found out that this particular particle that was making a beam inside of a cathode ray was deflected from the negatively charged plate, which meant that it had a negative charge. And therefore, we say the electron is a negative one charged uh, entity. Thompson measured the charge to mass ratio of an electron to be 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs per gram. And next year, we'll look a little bit closer at what a coulomb of charge actually is. As time progressed, scientists wanted to know what is the what is the actual mass of this negatively charged thing? And a gentleman named Millikan did an a, a famous experiment called the Millikan oil drop experiment, where he determined the uh, charge on the electron, and, and therefore uh, knew or used it to determine the mass charge ratio of the electron. In 1896, the French, several French scientists were studying a uranium compound when they discovered that it spontaneously, or by itself, emitted high-energy radiation. This spontaneous emission of radiation is called radioactivity. One of the people that worked with this was named Marie Curie and her husband Pierre. Further study of the nature of radioactivity revealed three types of radiation. The three types of radiation that were first identified were alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. Alpha particles are composed of two protons, and two neutrons, two particles inside an atom that we'll learn about in just a little bit. One alpha particle contains both of the two protons and two neutrons together. A beta particle is a negatively charged particle called an electron. And you can see here that the yellow line is a beta particle of electrons, and notice it's attracted to the positive plate. You also know that the, notice that the alpha particle, which has two protons, which are positively charged, that we'll learn about in just a second, is attracted to the negative plate. Gamma rays are high-energy photons that have no charge, and you'll see they're not deflected at all by the positive or negatively charged plate. Well, there was some growing evidence that the atom was composed of smaller particles and the first idea that came about in the early 1900s was that the atom was made or put together like something called plum pudding. The plum pudding model originally said that there were negatively charged particles inside of a sphere and there was some positive charge that was spread out throughout the entire sphere. Well, this was a short-lived idea because in approximately 1911, a famous scientist named Ernst Rutherford did a really famous experiment called the Gold Foil Experiment. Well, Rutherford was studying the angles at which alpha particles were deflected or scattered as they passed through a thin, thin, thin sheet of gold foil. The foil was only a couple thousand atoms thick. He and his co-workers discovered that most of the alpha particles passed directly through the foil without any deflection. 
A small percentage of these, though, were found to be slightly deflected on the order of one degree, consistent with Thompson's plum pudding model of the atom. Just for the sake of completeness, though, Rutherford suggested that they look for evidence of scattering at large angles. To everyone's surprise, a small amount of scattering was observed at very large angles. Some particles were even scattered straight back in the direction from which they came. The evidence or the explanation for this was not immediately obvious. You can see here are the alpha particles streaming towards the gold foil. Most of them passed straight through or were just slightly deflected because the gold foil atoms, of course, were thought to look like plum puddings and have a positive charge everywhere throughout the atom. But to their surprise, some of the particles were bent to the side or at huge angles or almost bounced straight back. Well, since some of the particles were deflected at large angles, Thompson's model could not be correct. Thompson's model was the plum pudding model. Rutherford postulated that a very small, dense nucleus with electrons around the outside of it existed, and thus came the first idea that we had something called the nuclear atom, because the small, dense nucleus contained a positively charged item, which we'll learn in a little while, is called a proton. Most of the volume of the atom is made up of empty space. You can see here in this small picture, here's the dense nucleus, and the volume right here is pretty much empty, except for a tiny, tiny electron that is actually about a thousand times smaller than the nucleus. Well, as time went along, protons were discovered by Rutherford in 1919, and neutrons were discovered by James Chadwick in 1932. As we know now, protons and neutrons compose the nucleus of an atom. Protons and electrons are the only particles that have a charge. Protons and neutrons have essentially the same mass. And the mass in an electron is so small that we ignore it. And we can see here that these are the relative mass comparisons in atomic mass units. That's what AMU stands for. You can see a proton and a neutron have a mass of approximately one, whereas an electron is uh, on the order of a thousand or, well, almost 10,000 times smaller. We use symbols to identify the elements. Symbols are one or two letters. Symbols are one or two letters that are used to identify a particular element, and they're universal. They're universal in all languages. A shape like this, which we know as a C, is always the symbol of the element carbon. This symbolization, called a nuclear symbolization right here, tells us the number of protons in the nucleus right down here, which is known as the atomic number. The atomic number is also symbolized by the letter Z, the capital Z right here. The number in the upper left-hand corner of this, of this representation is called the mass number, which is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons in the nucleus. So you can see on the top of this symbolization in the upper left-hand corner, we have mass number, protons plus neutron. In the lower left-hand corner, we have the number of protons. And by knowing those two numbers, you can always know not only the number of protons in the nucleus, but the number of neutrons as well by doing some subtraction. Atoms of the same element with different masses are called isotopes of one another. And we can see here four representations of isotopes of carbon. We can see that all carbon atoms have the same number of protons in the nucleus, six. But they have different mass numbers. And the only thing different, since they all have the same number of protons, could be the number of neutrons in the atom. As a matter of fact, this isotope, called carbon-11, only has five neutrons in the nucleus. This one has six. This one, carbon-13, only has seven neutrons in the nucleus. And this one has eight 
neutrons in the nucleus called carbon-14. Isotopes have different number of neutrons, but the same number of protons. Well, we can determine the uh, atomic mass of a particular sample of atom. An atomic and molecular masses can be measured with great accuracy using a mass spectrometer. And in class, we'll actually use a digital representation of how a mass spectrometer can determine how heavy or how massive a certain sample of an isotope is. Because in the real world we use large amounts of atoms and molecules, we use average masses in calculations. Because we use billions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of these atoms, we can't just say, well, here's one atom of carbon-13. We just have a chunk load of carbon, and some of it's carbon-11, some of it's carbon-12, some of it's carbon-13, some of it's carbon-14. And so what we use is what's called the average mass, and it's calculated from the isotopes of an element weighted by their relative abundances. The atoms, I'm sorry, the elements in the world are systematically cataloged on something called the periodic table. Elements are arranged in order of atomic number. You'll notice from left to right and top to bottom they go in order of atomic number from 1 to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. You'll also notice on this colorful representation of the periodic table that the metals are mostly located on the left side and the lower portion of the periodic table. The nonmetals are located in the upper right hand corner. And the ones along this staircase right here that are colored kind of in lavender are called the metalloids, which have properties of both metals and nonmetals. You can see that this lower area right here, sometimes called the rare earth elements, fits right into this slot here. And actually, these two blocks of elements would be moved further to the left. When one looks at the chemical properties of elements, one notices a repeating pattern of reactivities. You can see that elements in green, lithium, sodium, potassium, are all soft reactive metals. And if we look back at lithium, sodium, and potassium on the periodic table, you'll notice that they're one on top of another. These columns are called families of elements. You'll also notice the elements helium, neon, and argon in purple are non-reactive gases. If we look back at the periodic table, you'll see helium, neon, and argon are all in the same family, known as the noble gases. Rows on the periodic chart are called periods. Columns are called groups or families. Elements in the same group or family have similar chemical properties as we just saw. These five groups are known by their names. Group one, two, sometimes this one's called group 16 for simplicity group 17 for simplicity, and group 18 for simplicity. The periodic tables, as you see in class, actually have been labeled and numbered four different ways. And if we look back at the periodic table in this PowerPoint, you'll see that it's numbered as groups 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. And then these are the B numbers right here in the middle. And they look like they're out of order. You'll also notice that they're numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, all the way up to 18. This is the most popular way of numbering the groups or families. And so when we talk about groups or families, I'll always number them 1 through 18, and we'll talk about them in that way. If you look back here, this is group 1, 
alkali metals, two alkali earth metals. This is technically group 16, 17 called the halogens, and 18 called the noble gases. Nonmetals are on the right side, with the exception of hydrogen. Hydrogen should belong over here with the nonmetals. Metalloids border the stair step, and metals are on the left side of the chart. It's very important to know the positions of the metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. You need to memorize that. Chemical formulas are combinations of two or more atoms. The subscript to the right of the symbol of an element tells us the number of atoms of that element in one molecule of the compound. For example, H2O tells us there are two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Notice there's no one here below the O. And any time you see a symbol with no number below it, just assume there's a one there. CH4 means that there's four hydrogens, one, two, three, four, and one carbon. You can see here oxygen in its diatomic form, meaning there are di two oxygen atoms together here, has two of them stuck together. Molecular compounds are composed of molecules and almost always contain only nonmetals. This is a key to the upcoming portions of our entire class. Molecular things contain nonmetals. Molecular things contain nonmetals only. There are seven special elements on the periodic table. They occur naturally as molecules containing two atoms. Notice they're only nonmetals. And when they're alone by themselves, they exist in pairs. These are called diatomic, the prefix di meaning two, atomic meaning atoms, diatomic or two atom molecules. Notice they form a figure of a seven here on the periodic table. And some people call these, along with hydrogen, the sneaky seven because there are seven of them total and six of them come together to form a seven on the periodic table. You need to memorize these and be able to pick them off the periodic table. There are two types of chemical formulas. The first type are called empirical formulas. These give us the lowest whole number ratio of atoms of each element in a compound. Molecular formulas give us the exact number of atoms of each element in a compound. In chapter 3, we'll actually learn some calculations to determine both the empirical and molecular formulas of compounds. Structural formulas show us the order in which atoms are bonded, and perspective drawings also show the three-dimensional array of atoms in a compound, which becomes really important. If you've taken any biology before, perhaps they've talked about how form leads to function. Well, form leads to the function of atomic things as well. And so it's very important sometimes to know the three-dimensional makeup of different molecules. You can see here's a structural formula with dashes showing the hydrogens are connected to carbon. Here a perspective drawing with a wedge showing that H, this H is coming out of the book. A little dash, dash, dash showing that this H is going back into the book or into the page. And these H's with these uh, little dashes between mean that the hydrogen, carbon, hydrogens here are in the same plane. This is also called a space filling model right here, and this is good for helping find the uh, three-dimensional shape as well. When atoms lunar, lose or gain electrons, they become what are called ions. Cations are positive and are formed when elements are on the left side of the periodic chart. Everything left of this staircase here almost always forms positively charged ions. They're called cations cations. Memorize that name and know that metals almost always form positive cations. Positive ions called cations. Here are a few examples. Notice group one elements always form plus one and group two always form plus two and aluminum always forms plus three. Anions are negatively charged and are formed by elements on the right side of the periodic chart. Notice the uh, Nonmetals form negatively charged ions. When positive and negatives come together, they form what are called ionic compounds. They are composed of a metal and a nonmetal, and we're going to learn about those in a bit. 
Ionic bonds are generally formed between metals and nonmetals, and these form ionic compounds. These form ionic compounds. Notice we talked about molecular compounds before. Those contained only nonmetals. Now we talk about ionic compounds, which contain a metal. Contain a metal. Notice the difference. It's very important in our upcoming, not only this chapter, but many future chapters. Ionic compounds contain a metal. Molecular compounds contain only nonmetals. Because compounds are electrically neutral, one can determine the formula for a compound this way. The charge on the cations becomes the subscript of the anion. So take this plus 2, drop it, and swap it over here to the N. Take the charge on the anion and drop it and swap it over here to the cation. So the formula with magnesium and nitrogen would be N. G3N2. If these subscripts are not in the lowest whole number ratio, divide them by the greatest common factor. Here are many common cations. Notice how some of them can have more than one possible charge. Iron right here can be listed as iron plus 2 or iron Roman numeral 2. It can also be listed down here as iron plus 3 or iron Roman numeral 3. Notice a Roman numeral, in this for instance Roman numeral 2, is used to illustrate the positive charge. Notice that there could also be a copper of a different Roman numeral as well. It's not listed up here, but there's also a copper 1. Many transition metals, metals just to the left of the staircase, have multiple possible charges. This will become very important in our naming and formula writing in the next day or two. Here are a number of common anions. Notice there are a number of them that are just elements on the periodic table, and then there are some that are combinations of various elements. These anions sometimes contain a metal and a nonmetal, and together compose a charge of negative 2, as in the chromate ion. Notice the phosphate ion contains phosphorus and oxygen and has a negative 3 charge. These ions that contain more than one atom are called polyatomic ions. Poly meaning many, atomic meaning atoms, of course, and ion meaning that it has a plus or minus charge. Inorganic naming, sometimes known as inorganic nomenclature. Write the name of the cation. If the anion is an element, change its ending to IDE. If the anion is a polyatomic ion, simply write the name of the polyatomic ion. If the cation can have more than one possible charge, write the charge as a Roman numeral in parentheses. We will do many examples of that in the next video cast, in an upcoming video cast. When there are two oxyanions involving the same element. Now, what's an oxyanion? Well, an oxyanion is one that contains oxygen, and since it's called an anion, it has a negative charge. The one with the fewer oxygens ends in ite. For example, in NO2- called nitrite, and in SO3- called sulfite. And the one with more oxygens ends in 8. You can think of it as it ate more oxygen, and so it has more oxygens, and it ends in ATE. Notice NO3- minus is called nitrate, and SO4-2 minus two is called sulfate because it contains one more oxygen than the other oxyanion. The one with the second fewer oxygens ends in ite, as in, for example, in chloride. The one with the second most oxygens ends in ate, as in ClO3- or chlorate. The one with the fewest oxygens, in other words, one less than ClO2, you put the prefix hypo on the front of it, and it still ends in ite. This is called hypochlorite, which is listed right down here, ClO minus. The one with the most oxygens has the prefix per in front of it and has the ending 8, as in perchlorate, ClO4 minus, right here. Notice the prefix per means more than the regular 8.
The prefix hypo means less than the regular ite. If the anion in an acid ends in ide, change the ending to ic in an acid and add the prefix hydro. Acids generally, generally for what you need to know right now, begin with a hydrogen and then contain a nonmetal hydrogen and a nonmetal. Or they can start with a hydrogen and contain a polyatomic ion. If they contain only two kinds of elements, like for example here where there's hydrogen and chlorine, we call them a binary acid because they only contain by two types of atoms. If they're binary, put the prefix hydro on the front, put the stem from the element in the middle, like chlor, and then in an ic, it's called hydrochloric acid. HBr is called hydrobromic acid, HI, hydroiodic acid. If the anion in the acid ends in ite, change the ending to us. For example, HClO3. ClO3 is called hypochlorite. Change the ending from ite to us and call it hypochlorous acid. Keep the prefix hypo on there, just change the ending to us. Notice it starts with an H, so we can identify it as an acid. HClO2 is just called chlorous acid because it doesn't have a hypo in front of it, but ClO2 is called chlorite, so change ite to us. If the anion in the acid ends in eight, change the ending to ic. HClO3 composed of the ClO3 chlorate ion would be changed to chloric acid. Notice the IC ending replaces the 8. HClO4 begins with the prefix per and ends with the ending ic. Well, what about compounds that contain only nonmetals? Remember, compounds that contain only nonmetals are called molecular. These compounds are named differently than, than ionic compounds that contain a metal. These less, these, in these, the less electronegative atom is usually listed first, which we'll learn about way in the future in chapter 9. And a, I'm sorry, in chapter 7. And a prefix, and you don't have to worry about what that word means right now, a prefix is used to denote the number of atoms of each element in the compound. Mono is used on the first element listed, however. The ending on the more, uh, on the second element is listed or changed to ide. For example, in CO2, the first element is called carbon, the second element is called dioxide because there are two oxygens. Notice we don't use the prefix mono on the first atom if there's only one of them. This is called carbon tetrachloride because the prefix tetra means four. If the prefix ends with an O and the name of the element begins with a vowel, the two successive vowels are often stuck together into one. This one is called dinitrogen, prefix di because there's two, pentoxide, Instead of saying pentaoxide, we just get rid of the A and call it pentoxide because there are five oxygens. In the future, we'll take a look at a lot of this naming and formula writing in the next number of video casts.